However, as trained ninjas, you already know that the answer almost always is another question. For example, what could we say about the level of the signal to be sampled? Is it always positive? What ranges could it take? And many other questions, right? For now, let's assume the interviewer says that the signal could be anything up to 100 millivolts below the supply you would be using. Yo! What's going on, everyone? This is Vitor, according to ChatGPT. No announcements today, so let's jump into the content right away. Let's say you have decided to interview for a position as a designer of data converters that used some sort of sample and hold circuitry. As you already know, we will have a signal of interest that we will have to sense and convert from an analog signal to a digital one. So the interviewer, as you will see in a second, decides to focus on one of the most overlooked elements when building such things. For now, the interviewer will simply ask you, how can we sample a signal? Of course, as the agile ninja you are, you will come up with the simplest solution to this problem because why complicate yourself, right? So you will draw the following circuit and explain that in an ideal sense, we can use a capacitor and a couple switches to sample a signal. Of course, there are more complex ways of sampling a signal, but to the first order, this model will suffice. Now, obviously, if interviews were this simple, then you wouldn't be here, would you? So, the interviewer tells you that he definitely appreciates the simplicity, but is also pushing you to make your ideal circuit a little bit more real, and asks you, how would you implement that switch in a real circuit? You would be tempted to quickly reply with either an NMOS or a PMOS device. However, as trained ninjas, you already know that the answer almost always is another question. For example, what could we say about the level of the signal to be sampled? Is it always positive? What ranges could it take? And many other questions, right? For now, let's assume the interviewer says that the signal could be anything up to 100 millivolts below the supply you would be using. Given this is the case, solely an NMOS or a PMOS would not be enough, so we would be using a combination of both in this way. Great, says the interviewer, and now asks you what undesired effects would you get with this particular configuration. Obviously, the comparisons should be performed with an ideal switch. We know that ideal switches have zero resistance when closed and infinite resistance when open. So, the first undesired effect, of course, is the finite resistance when open and most importantly, the non-zero resistance when closed. You can elaborate on what the impact of these finite, non-zero resistances are, but we are not focusing on these effects on this particular video. What else can you think of? The interviewer will ask you. Well, the ideal switch does not have any capacitance associated with it, while this configuration will clearly have parasitic capacitances from the gate of the device to the diffusions. So the interviewer asks, what will these capacitances do? There are a couple of things that these parasitic capacitances will do. In today's video, we will be focusing on one of your possible answers. Kickback noise. By the way, if you would like us to make a video explaining the other possible answers and effects, please leave us a comment below. Let's get back to kickback. The interviewer agrees with you and asks you how can you reduce the kickback noise. As with many of our questions, there are plenty of ways to solve the problem. But first, 
explaining to the interviewer why a kickback noise appears may earn you some extra points as it shows you know the subject. We won't go into too much detail about this topic as this is not meant to be a lecture, but kickback noise appears due to the charge stored in the gate to the fusion caps having to go somewhere when the transistor switches. Given that we have a pass gate structure, one of the ways to solve this problem would be to size the P and N devices in such a way that their parasitic capacitances are identical, so that the charge demanded by the P parasitic caps can be supplied by the N parasitic caps and vice versa. Of course, this is a big if and it's very technology dependent. Great, says the interviewer. Would the only thing we need is for the device parasitic caps to be equal? The answer is clearly no, because we're talking about balancing the charge supplied by one of the devices and the charge demanded by the other. So we can see that we have two signals controlling the pass gate, and they are complementary. So your answer should be, we will also need the control signals to be completely aligned, like this. If they are misaligned, we have completely missed the purpose of matching the parasitic caps. So the interviewer asks you the following. Would you be able to design the circuit to create the control signals you described, while also keeping in mind that we will need some dead time to pass the sampled signal? The dead time, of course, is when we want to sample the signal and we don't want the input to whatever our circuit is over here to be contaminated from whatever we are sampling so that we never have both switches closed at the same time. I am going to pause here for a second and make you realize the following. The interviewer's objective was always clear. In this case, I want the candidate to be able to design the circuit that produces complementary and aligned clock signals. But a great interviewer will never just ask you to do that right off the bat. Why? Because if you look at all the background information we went through to get to this point, the interviewer has been probing the fundamental knowledge that leads to our need for designing such a circuit. Imagine that the candidate would be able to produce such a circuit, but has no notion or no background as to why it's needed. Would that be a solid candidate or a mediocre one? That is how we are helping you prepare for your future interviews by looking at a question and always asking yourself, what are the assumptions? Why is this needed? How many other ways are there to solve the same problem? At the risk of sounding like a broken record, we will say this again. Interviews are simply technical conversations that you have with people to assess their technical depth and evaluate if you would like to work with that person in the long term. So if you would like to keep on expanding your knowledge and the types of interview problems you're exposed to, make sure to check out our Patreon site. It has already made a difference for many of our members. All right, back to the problem. Let's try to design the circuit using logic gates. At first, we will be tempted to simply do the following. However, the problem here is that the clock and clock bar signals have a difference of a gate delay between them. Now you can think to yourself, is a gate delay really going to screw up the rest of my circuit? Maybe, but the task at hand was to design something that closely resembles this. Let's focus first on the dead time. How could we do that? I am going to give you a little bit of time for you to come up with the answer. All right, so before designing anything, let's first draw what we are trying to accomplish. If I have a clock signal and its complement like this, and want to have some dead time, then the resulting waveform should look like this. Now, from the top waveform, we would like to come up with the following waveforms. To design some dead time, it would seem like we have to push the rising edge of the clock by some amount. And, and the signal with the fallen edge of the clock. 
So if we would have a delayed version of the same clock like this, we could logically end them together and get what we're after, like this. This delta time can simply be a chain of buffers. To design the complement of this clock, again, we could simply add an inverter like this. But that will not get us where we need. So what could we potentially do to match them? Well, it is apparent that we're missing some sort of delay element here. But given that we are already using an inverter, let's assume it's already minimum size, there are no other gates that we could use to create this synthetic delay. Hmm, that's awkward. What do you think we could do? You didn't really think we would give you the answer just like that, right? It is time to put our thinking caps on. If you would like to understand how some of our Patreon members are approaching the same problem, you can join our Patreon and have access to a private Discord server we have set up where you can brainstorm with other ninjas all the possible solutions. Here's a little hint. The answer is within the video already. Magic, right? Thank you so much for stopping by and checking us out. Don't forget to support us by subscribing to the channel and checking out our Patreon site. Here is some sample content that you can find from our contributors.